What's going on, everybody? Rob Doster here from the Field of 68, back with another episode of the A10 Insider Podcast. I got a good one on the way for you today. I was able to head down to D.C. Uh, I sat with George Mason head coach Kim English uh, in Fairfax for about 45 minutes last week. Uh, we talked about his path from Baltimore to the NBA. We talked about what's he, what he's expecting out of his Patriots team uh, this season. We talked about what this Atlantic 10 conference could be and where he expects his team to grow and the challenge of competing with the likes of Dayton and St. Louis and St. Bonaventure and all of the other power programs uh, that are in this league. It's a really fun conversation. I hope you guys are going to enjoy it. I've known Kimmy for probably 13 years now. Uh, you know, he's he's younger than me, but he's one of the guys I think that I know the best in the coaching ranks. So I'm excited to share this conversation with you. Before we do a couple programming notes, uh, as always, I just want to let you guys know that the Almanac, it's still available. We still have two weeks before the start of the season. Even when the season starts, we have about five or six days before the games really get going. Uh, so if you want to be the most prepared that you can possibly be for college basketball this season, make sure that you pick up your copy. It is $19.99 for a digital subscription. Find it in the link below. Uh, I also got to pimp out the daily for you. Uh, it is the Field of 68 newsletter. It comes to you every morning in your inbox, 8.30 a.m. The best way for you to get prepared and stay up to date on all the happenings in college basketball is by subscribing to the daily. Um, and I also want to let you guys know we do have a merch store, Field of 68.shop. Go check it out. You use the promo code touchdown. You get 20% off your first purchase there. So now that that's out of the way, let's get into this conversation with George Mason head coach, Kim English. And now let me welcome on to the A10 Insider Podcast of one and only George Mason head coach, Kim English, who is now the third youngest head coach in the country. Thanks, Drew Valentine. How you doing, man? I'm, I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me here. This is a great little me. setup you guys got here. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. We got good, uh, good locker room. Sure. So first time we actually met, I'm going to tell this story. First okay. time we actually met, 2012, I was working for a website that I own called Ballin' is a Habit. Do you remember this? Had to be like 2010. 2010. It I think it was, no, it was tw the, we, we, the first time we spoke was 2010. First time we met was 2012 because it was on our road trip. Kansas State. It was Kansas, uh, Baylor. Baylor was playing at Missouri. Oh, okay. And good. I couldn't get in okay, touch good, 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 with good. the SID. Okay. Right? Yeah. Couldn't get in touch with the SID. So I just sent you a message on Twitter, a DM on Twitter. Yeah. I said, hey, Kimmy, uh, it was the day before. Mm -hmm. We're literally driving from Madison, Wisconsin, down to Columbia, Missouri. We could find it. And I sent you a DM and I yep. said, I said, Kimmy, I need help. I can't get in. Like, I can't get anyone to respond to me. Can you help me get a ticket? And you were like, I got you. David Ryder didn't respond. Yeah, didn't respond. And we ended up getting, uh, you got us credentials. We got yeah. in. Um, we got a nice meal out of it. Yeah. We, uh, we saw you lose, though. Well, it was well, it was Kansas State then. Like I said, no, it wasn't no, it Baylor. Was, you know what? I think it was Texas A&M. Then Chris go. Middleton. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Seven, Chris Middleton. Seven and four at home. Your, your teammate with uh, the Pistons, right? That's right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Long way since then, huh? No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. Would his, you his career? Was not going <laughs> yeah. <to be> well, <laughs> well, we'll we'll talk about that a little yeah. bit. I do want to talk about your NBA career, but yeah. um, how do you? Did you envision this right when you were thirty four years old? Did you imagine like I, I'm going to be a head coach, Atlantic Ten program? I'm going to this is this is when you were growing up. Is this what you wanted? Yeah, I've always known I was going to uh, be into coaching or front office or something in um, you know the executive side of of running um, you know a sports team at the highest level. I just thought it would be after a much longer playing career. I didn't think I'd fizzle out at 25, 24, whenever it was. Yeah, I started coaching at Tulsa. Um, but my I was obsessed about the NBA um, as a player and got to the NBA and had a, a cup of coffee one year with Detroit, a training camp with Chicago. And I got overseas and it just, it wasn't for me as far as a growth mindset, um, the learning curve, um, you know, the excitement around the game. Um, so I just got a head start on my coaching career um, a bit earlier. So why why wasn't it for you? Because you you were good enough. You could have made yeah, a lot of money playing. Yeah, over there I could for a still play time. right now. I could play. I think I could play in the Euro League right now if I wanted to. I could play in Europe right now. Um, I could probably play for another. He's not confident at all, folks. I could play another four <laughs> years for sure. I mean, until I'm 38, maybe. Um, but I learned so much in my one season in the NBA about the game, right. You know, playing for Lawrence Frank, um, you know, learning talking to Joe Dumars, 
playing for Tom Thibodeau in Chicago, studying the other coaches, all the assistants, Steve Hetzel was with the Blazers now, Charles Klask, Roy Rogers. I learned so much. I got obsessed about learning about the game. Mm -hmm. When I got to Europe, um, different game, but I, 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 I just wasn't learning as much. Yeah, I felt like it was, you know, uh, kind of a hybrid between college and the league. Um, the learning just wasn't the same. Um, I lost interest. And um, so I wanted to learn again. Um, so I made the decision to get come back uh, to the States. And it was out of a job with uh, Philly, with Sam mm -hmm. Hickey, or uh, an assistant coaching job with Frank Haith at Tulsa. Um, ultimately chose college because I, I love Sam. Sam Hickey is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, but I, I, I just didn't know if Philly's ownership would trust the process. Um, <laughs> I believed in his process. Like I knew it was yeah. going to work. I knew it was not a shadow of a doubt it would work, but from a job security standpoint, I didn't think that the ownership group there would give him the time he needed. Right. And I chose Tulsa and I was right. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they did let, let him go. Um, but it, it's worked out for you. Yeah, It's worked yeah, out. So you've been, absolutely. you've been in coaching for a, what now? Nine years, eight this or nine is, years. This, this is year eight. So when you first got in, how long did you think it was going to take before you got a job? A head job? I, I don't know. Like I never even like focused on that aspect of it. You know, I focused on the preparation for it. Right. Right. And in the off season, during seasons, I've always had what my program would look like. I built it slowly. What I liked from Frank, what I didn't, Tad, Rick, Coach uh, Mike Anderson, what I like, what I didn't like and kind of build what I would want my program to look like. And it sounds really good philosophically mm -hmm. until, until you're in it. And some of that stuff don't make no sense, right? When you're in it <laughs> with 19 year olds, um, man. And I, I only focused on the job that I was at at the time. Right. Like I thought Tulsa was the best job in the world. I didn't want any other job. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, elite coach right now that approached me about a job at another elite, elite, elite program when I was at Tulsa. And I said, no, like I, I said, I wasn't interested. I just, cause I was like, this is my Frank Hayes, my head coach. Like I love Tulsa. I think we got a good squad. I said, no. And he was, and I like left and like, I told my, my, some friends in the business, they was like, really? Like <laughs> you said no to, it was right. like, you said no to, it, it, it was before it got to, but it was like interest. Mm -hmm. And he was like, maybe you should have some interest. And I was like, it, it just changed my mind. And then, you know, I speak to Tad Boyle and, and, and well, the, uh, there's and, a level of loyalty Colorado. that comes with that, right? Like Frank Haith was your college it is. coach. It is. And he got you in the business. It is. So it it's, is. it's understandable. He, but. Did. he did. He did. And, and, but it was, it was the loyalty aspect. And I just really was so immersed in where I was. Mm -hmm. And then Colorado comes up and I and the same thing like Tad Boyle if you if 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 a kid looked at Tad Boyle in his eyes and, and said he was choosing Kentucky or Duke Tad Boyle would look at him like you're a fool like you have a chance to come to Boulder Colorado Tad Boyle thinks the University of Colorado is the best job in the country and like that's his strength it, it, it helps him in recruiting it helps him in player development and game planning and everything you know because it's in fundraising you feel the conviction but mm -hmm. I was at Colorado you know, could have left for a few places, no interest in leaving. Like, you know, until uh, my relationship with Mike Schwartz, um, coach Barnes, um, mm -hmm. had a history. It was like family took me to, to UT and, and, and now here. So you're 34 years old, you're a head coach. How much does that help you connect with the kids that you're recruiting? Cause you're, you're much more the same generation as, as the kids that are playing for you right now than someone that's 55, 60, 65 years old. Yeah, you know, I think it's cool. Um, I look at us as like, uh, I think I look at my generation like the last of the older generation. Like, I know what a phone booth is. Right. I know what a phone book is. Right. I know what it's like to drink out of a water hose, play outside. You know, like uh, <laughs> these kids don't anymore. Like mm -hmm. may not know what a phone booth is. Right. But I also I'm young enough to know how to, you know, work the interface of Snapchat or Instagram or, you know, 
the latest music. So it's cool to be able to relate um, to these kids. But I think all coaches are kept young to an extent. You have to be. You have to be because you you're around you're, it so much. And the you're new just trend. playing a sport, right? Yeah. Like yeah. It, it, as serious as we all take this, oh, it's, it's a, a sport. Oh, I say it all the time, man. It's a child's game. Yeah. Like we're getting, we're getting paid to coach a child's game. You know, and it, and it's it's fun. I've never worked a day in my life. I've never worked a single day in my life. So I want to talk to you about a video that uh, that you posted. I want to say it was about a month ago. You were playing on a court somewhere outside. Yeah. You were playing with two kids that were just down there, yeah. and you 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 drove and you dunked on one of them, and everyone kind of went nuts. Take <laughs> well, take me through what happened in this this video, and we'll we'll drop it in and make sure everybody yeah. can see this. But no, I was just playing outside with my daughters in, in Arlington, and um, just playing with some kids shooting around. And um, I just love being around basketball, you know, mm -hmm. whenever I can. I can go out there sometimes and I'll play around, play horse or 21. And I just got a little dunk, man. It wasn't much. It wasn't <laughs> not, nothing to write home about. Surely they're, they're, they're kids and the rim wasn't 10 feet. So, yeah. But it felt good. That was cool. It was cool. It was cool. It was cool. So what led to you posting that? When, when you get nothing. Nothing. It was just, it was just like, was I don't fun. know. It was, it was authentic. It was organic. I just, thought it, I thought it was hilarious, you know, it, it, and it's Instagram. Like yeah. I don't think I tweeted it. I don't think I tweeted. No, it was it was Instagram. Yeah, yeah. my my Instagram following is like really intimate. It's close yeah. friends. It's not Twitter. I I wouldn't post that on Twitter, but <laughs> so now it's going to be on Twitter. Yeah. Well, so it was a little showcase that that you actually had some game back in the day, right? So I do want to talk about your NBA career because I'm I'm curious how you view it, right? So you were a kid. You were you weren't a top 100 crew, right? I I checked it. Just I think you were like 111. Yeah, 111. You uh, you you probably shouldn't like in theory have gone to the SEC when you get to Big the 12. SEC or Big Twelve. Yeah, you probably shouldn't have been an All Big Twelve player based on who you were as a recruit, and you probably shouldn't have been an NBA player. Like yet, you made it to the pinnacle of the profession, but you also only lasted like two years. But in those yeah. two years, you're one of the 500 best in the world at your job. So yeah. from a if you look at it from 35,000 feet, unequivocally successful. But I know you, and you didn't end up being. An all-star, you didn't end up being a top 10 player in the yeah, NBA. Yeah. So I know you're looking at it like, man, like yeah. it was I no, was, I got I a list bomb, of right? like 10 dudes in the league right now that I'm better than, like right now in my mind. <laughs> like, and I've like I've I've felt that since like 2012, and I've I've like tracked their careers or whatever. Um, no, I had a I was a failure. I was a failure. I was a failure. See, um, I I go ahead, as but I, dis player. I disagree. Yeah, I like disagree so I, I yeah, I worked really hard. I mean, I, I was I was I worked really hard at, at my craft. Um, I competed and I was tough. Um you know, I had good size. I could shoot. So, you know, I had a skill. I worked really hard. I, I was competitive. We won. Um, I think when you do all those things, you'll have a chance, mm -hmm. you know. And right. So, yeah, you say you're one of the best 450 in the world when you make a roster. But truthfully, the last 150 guys in the NBA, you could swap those guys out for about 200 guys in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's circumstantial. It's. It's right fit, right, right amount of right play. fit, right yeah. time, salary. Like yeah. it's so it's many everything. things. So that there's a humility of it all to know that. I mean, I, Kate, like you know, Corey Higgins has played in the NBA, but Corey Higgins mm -hmm. is making a ton of money. And he could be in the NBA right now. Like there's a ton of players. Um, but no, I didn't make it. I I, I didn't work as hard uh, when I got to the league as the at the level of the obsession I had at Missouri. I was obsessed at Missouri. Um, was in the gym every night, you know, working on my game, dedicated, dialed in, locked in, you know, because my dream was to get to the NBA. It was to get, 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 mm -hmm. get, G-E-T, get. Um, and that was the wrong dream. Like my dream should have been to try to, to be a Hall of Famer. Right. It should have been to be an all-star, to win multiple championships, to be one of the 75 greatest. Like that should have been my dream. And then... Getting drafted is like just another day. You bit, get right back to work. You work hard. It's a rung on the ladder. It shows you, you just you go, keep right? going. You yeah. keep going. And even if the likelihood of me becoming an NBA Hall of Famer was very low, the likelihood of me becoming a top 75 player was very low. But if that was my mindset, you think that that drive would have maybe made me miss better. Mm -hmm. Right. I I hit my aim. <laughs> I hit my target of getting to the NBA. If my target was top 75 Hall of Famer, my miss might have been five years, right? It might have been uh, uh, Justin, I think his name is Justin Holiday's career, yeah. right? Or Gary you might have gotten another career. It might have, you got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. See, I, the way that I look at it is once you, once you get there, 
You're nothing. There's no. Oh, there's no more qualification. Starts all over. You're yeah, back you're, at you're, the bottom. But you're, you, it's, it's, it's it's a success. Uh, the story is a success if you get there, yeah. right? Because it's so hard to get there. Yeah. And once you get there, start then you over. start everything over. I wish someone told me that. Yeah, but you got to you got to look at it in the context yeah. of you've made it to something that that only 500 people at a time are able to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I wish someone had told me that. Yeah. So when, when you look back now and you're talking to some of these, these kids that have that same goal and that same dream that you have, even if it's just to get there, not to be hall of fame or not to be Kobe, but to, to get there, what do you tell them? What kind of advice do you, do you well, I don't even talk experience? about it unless I see the other things in you first, like you gotta be obsessed. You gotta be borderline crazy. You know, mm-hmm. you gotta be crazy, either crazy, talented, crazy talents, like a freak of nature. Like it's like, it's like 20 of those guys. Yeah. 25 of those guys. Maybe you got to be Giannis or LeBron, basically. Giannis, LeBron, KD, Steph Curry. They're freaks. Like mm-hmm. don't emulate them. Don't try to be like them. Don't watch their game. They're aliens. Like they are aliens. Victor Wembanyama. Alien. Oh, yeah. Alien. <laughs> can I talk about him? Is he a prospect? Know, Is he a college prospect? No, he's not. Right. No, I can not. talk about he's him. Gone. <laughs> so, so it's like, you got to be, that's in another category. That's Mm -hmm. another stratosphere. Everyone else that's in the NBA, they're mortals, but they're different in the way they work, the way they train, the way they carry carry themselves, the way they compete, in how tough they are, and how their one elite skill set is. You know, and and so if you see that, you know, I had Devin Dinkins, our point guard today after practice, I'm talking to him about to be a little guard, you got to be crazy, man. You got to be crazy. And uh, I put them on the phone with Phil Pressy this morning, McKinley Wright this morning, Will Bynum. Like, I'm just talking to, and I'm letting him talk to these little NBA guards about what it's like to get there. How do you get there? What do you got to be? And McKinley Wright's on the bus flying from Phoenix back to Dallas to play Memphis tomorrow mm-hmm. whenever they play. And McKinley's, you know, DMP last night. He's on a two-way with Dallas. Great player at Colorado. He's like, man, it's hard, man. He's like, you, 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 you got to be a, uh, MF, you gotta be, you mm-hmm. gotta, you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be different, right? You gotta be incredibly tough. What's the saying? You gotta have that dog in you. You gotta have, you gotta, you gotta be a killer. You gotta have mm-hmm. that dog. You gotta, Rick Barnes, you say about Keon Johnson and Jaden Springer, Springer, he said, they'll bite you. <laughs> they'll bite you. And like, they, they might, <laughs> they might like to be an NBA little guard fighting over a ball screen. Mm-hmm. If you're getting posted up, you gotta be willing to bite somebody. You gotta be crazy. Um, incredibly tough, right? You gotta, you gotta be wicked smart. You gotta know everything. You gotta see everything. You gotta know every read. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, um, you, you, McKinley said, you can't turn the ball over. Like you cannot turn the ball over. And then you gotta be able to jump really high or shoot really good. Right. Carson Edwards or Nate Robinson. Yep. Right. Like just to have a chance, you know, so that's the other stuff. You know, that's and you can do that for every position all the way down one through five um, if you're not counting the aliens. Right. But the work ethic is the it's the yeah. biggest thing. It's the yeah. biggest thing. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. the, the level of skill for NBA, play, it's if you go and watch an NBA game and then come back and watch like the best college uh, basketball game, the, the difference, uh, the difference in ability, it's it's uh, night and day. You're not watching. I say this all the time. Yeah. You're not watching college basketball because yeah. you want to see the best basketball that you, you're watching yeah. for the environment. Yeah. You're watching because you love your school. Yeah. Yeah. You're watching because you're invested in a team for some reason. Yeah. You're watching because there's always some kind of crazy storyline. If you want to watch the best basketball players, go. So put on a bad NBA game. <laughs> not even, not even close. The, the, yeah. the skill level, the talents, the talent. Um, you know, passing and catching. <laughs> uh, they do a lot better than, than that's our guys. how I know it's an early practice for you when you're sitting yeah. here like, yeah, we, we need to work on passing and catching. No, man, I'm <laughs> telling you, man. Like NBA guys can really pass. It can really catch. Like, and they can really shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, and the passing. I mean, don't. Don't overstate passing, man. It is, it is so important. And yep. those guys do it at elite level. Yep. Chris Middleton. Mm-hmm. He went from being a guy that was a second round pick. Yeah. And now he's a guy that got that, what yeah. was it, 240 yeah. million, whatever yeah. it was. What what did you see in him in terms of the work ethic? Was so that just one of those guys? I said, I got to play against Chris in college. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he was a freshman at AM when I was a sophomore at Missouri. Um, he did three years, I did four. So you knew how talented he was. When we got drafted together, I, one of the first things I said in our press conference was, and you can find it. You know, I said that the Pistons just drafted a top 20, just yeah. dropped, drafted top 20 talent. He was, I thought, lottery talent. I used, used to say Chris Middlekid can do everything that Kevin Durant can do. He's just not seven foot, right? He's six, six. 
Um, but what I do remember about him was, uh, one, I was a six man our first game at eight points against the Rockets. He didn't play. He didn't play for like the first two weeks of the season. <laughs> Um, I have, you don't, you don't hold, hold that over his head. At all, no, no, no. He's a better player. He's a better player. No, he's always been way more talented. I'm not super talented. Like I, I worked hard. I could shoot. I played hard. I, I wasn't, I'm not super talented. Um, Chris is talented, right? No talent, just abound. Um, I had the better summer league, much better summer league, like not even close. I averaged like, I think 18 points, like six rebounds. I was much better. He was not good. In summer league. He wasn't good in camp. Um, but his agent, whoever his agent is, didn't settle for what Detroit was offering. You know, Detroit offered he and I both one year guaranteed second year team option. Um, and I signed it right away. Like, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm in. Let's go. Come on, let's do it. One year, <laughs> baby. Boom. Chris, he Chris held out. He wasn't in Detroit training for like a few weeks. His agent made sure he got two plus one. Mm -hmm. And he did. He was picked. Five picks higher than me, 39. Um, he was picked number 39. I was 44. He got two years right off the bat. He got a two plus one. So after the season, if you're on a bad team and you have an expiring contract, they get rid of it, right? They 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 get off of it if they can. It helps the GM look a little better, like mm -hmm. look like we're making changes. I average 2.9 points a game. They cut me. They they sign an Italian dude named Luigi Dottomi. He comes in, you know how much he averaged for Detroit? 2.9 points. Like it, it was, <laughs> but it looked good. It looked like you're doing something. Um, but Chris, they get off Chris. They get rid of, they trade Chris Middleton. The only reason they traded him and didn't cut him was because he had another year. They traded Chris Middleton, Brandon Knight, and Slava Kravstov. They trade them to Milwaukee for Brandon Jennings. Worked out pretty well for Milwaukee. Worked out really well for Milwaukee. Right. And that little small thing, the agent fighting for that little bit more, one year more, maybe, maybe, maybe Chris gets cut and someone else picks them up, you know, and, and it still goes the same. But that fight at the front end of his career maybe led to what he is today and the rest of the, his, the his, agent earned his 4%. Absolutely. He did. <laughs> you know, and that's All a right. cool story. So talking about NBA, Josh Aduro. Your star center. I, can, mm -hmm. I don't even know if I want to call him a center. You call him a center? Yeah, we call him whatever you want. Yeah. He's not offended. Star big guy. Yeah. Big fella. Yeah. Uh, went through the process. Yeah. Right. He came back to school. Yeah. Um, one, what did you kind of, what did, what was the feedback he got? And two, as the coach of his college team, how do you balance developing a guy for the next level when it may not be the same role that you need him to play at this level? You yeah. know what I'm saying? I think great and open dialogue. You know, if you look at Josh and I's phone text conversation, it's always me sending him videos and I'm watching a practice. I sent him a clip last night of Porzingis uh, making a play that we need him to make more. Uh, you know, it's showing him how it relates, telling him exactly what it needs to be. And if he can do it, I don't care what the skill set is, if he mm -hmm. can get it done, it will help your college team. Like, right. <laughs> like you know, we don't want – you know, Josh is very dominant inside, but for him to make it to the next level, he's going to have to guard on the perimeter and be able to stretch the floor. If he does those two things for us, hey, that's really, really good. Right. So we're going to work on it. We're going to build it, but just know where your strengths are now, where your bread is buttered right now. But no, we're in it together to develop you, to help you get there. Um, you know, so it's good enough for the next level. But um, the process with him was, it was, it was different. It was, it was very uh, specific. I, Josh was not a draft pick this year. Right. And we all knew it. Uh, what was best for Josh Aduro and for our team, truthfully, what, sorry, not what was best for Josh, probably it. In my opinion, after we lost to Fordham in the A-10 tournament, what was best for Josh Aduro was to take time off. We, and I hate to use hyperbole, but we rode him. We rode him hard his mm -hmm. usage was through the roof we weren't an incredibly deep team we were an incredibly talented team last year we rode him he had a heavy load i mean he had a concussion last season he had knee and he had a, you know covid he had to sit down you know tendonitis flare back up during his covid uh time off uh, uh he had a long season right. and he gave us everything he truthfully what was best for our program and 
was for him to forget about the NBA draft, just worry about recovering from this very long season, grueling season. Um, but I think what was best for him in the long term was for him to go through the process. Now he had to work out, he had to go through the, the spring training process. He had to work out for uh, an NBA team. Uh, he got great feedback. He came back with us in the summer. What I mean, my mindset was, I know how in- integral it was for me to go through the draft process as a junior and how much it prepared me for my senior year. My junior year, I was not an NBA player. I had terrible workouts. I was overwhelmed. I played poorly. I, the balls felt different. The game was fast. It was, it was like this when I did the process my first time. When I went through the process my second time, it was like, you knew what was coming. I knew exactly what was coming. I knew, exactly, I knew the way the balls felt. I knew the way the workouts went. I knew what to wear. I knew the questions they'd ask. I knew every, I, I, I was so comfortable in the process. I was thinking about that with Josh. What was best for Josh as he's a, you know, I knew he wasn't getting drafted. I, you can call all 30 teams and get mm-hmm. that answer, right? Where, where is he? Who? Right. Or whatever, you know, or, or he's late, late to undraft. But I thought what was best for him in the future was to get that experience, get those jitters out now so that the next next spring when he's in those workouts, he's, he's more comfortable. Right. So now that you got him back, NIL is a thing, obviously. Yeah. He's got some NIL deals. Yeah. Um, you are young enough where I know that you how you feel about players getting paid and how you feel about that, right? Uh, I also think it's interesting that you have all of what, like three months of head coaching experience where NIL wasn't a thing and wasn't legal. So how uh, you're the new normal when it comes yeah. to what college basketball is going to end up being yeah. as a coach, right? Yeah, is that fair yeah. To say? yeah it's level. It's levels, right? right? What's happening around the country as mm-hmm. far as deals and collectives and universe. I mean, like Tennessee, higher inspire, or, you know, we have a collective, most places have a collective guys getting the stuff on their own. Um, it's just, you know, we're doing it the right way. It's 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 truly an IL for our players. Mm-hmm. It's it's not, you know, it's it's not it's not pay for play. It's not right now at George Mason. And I love that. I love that it's legitimate. Our guys have a player ran collective. Our guys are all they all sit on the board of our collective. Every domestic born per- person that wears a jersey on our team gets. NIL money. Um, our fans can participate in it. Local businesses do a great job. George Mason, in my opinion, is the most important thing to, uh, you know, you know, putting into this economy that is Northern Virginia. I don't know what the, the figure is. Six hundred million dollars George Mason alum generate for this area. Um, largest university in the state. So there, there's people that have a vested interest in this area in our guys and our and our all our guys i'm kind of seeing their faces that look through the film room all have really cool deals and um but now it's making sure that they don't be like me when i got to the nba mm-hmm. when they get some money in their pocket make sure they keep the hunger and the, Do you tell them and that? the fight oh straight up i mean straight up how did nil help texas a m lose appalachian state <laughs> How did NIL help Notre Dame lose to Marshall? It didn't. It didn't. And I think that's the, the beauty of having football before basketball season is we Kentucky get losing to St. Peter's. We get a lot of examples. I'm going to keep it cross sport. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it, 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 you better make sure your stuff's right. Yeah. You know, make sure your mind's right. The main you know, thing has to be the main thing. And, and that's the game. So that's the yeah. game. It, you know, in the last dance, Michael Jordan said he knew that his game was his most important endorsement deal, mm-hmm. you know, because no one wants to support a bum. You right. Know? Yeah. So if, as long as you're performing, the money's going to come in. All right. We talked about Josh, Victor Bailey. I want to ask you about him because I remember, I, I don't know if I'm, a, I'm allowed to say this, but I remember having conversations with you about him six, seven, eight years yeah. ago. Eight years ago. You, yeah. So that, that he's a six year senior. Yeah. You recruited him at three different schools. You, he's played for you yes. at two different schools. Yes. Yeah. I mean, have you ever had a player that you had a relationship with for that long? No. Uh, he's one of the first recruits I've ever – I think Fred Thatch was actually – the. I looked at my DMs. Fred Thatch was the first <laughs> recruit I ever messaged from Sykeston, Missouri. I was at Tulsa. just got the job in May of 15 uh, – or March, whenever it was. And um, VJ was close thereafter. Um, played with – sorry, played with RM5 out of Texas. He's from Austin, Texas. Recruited him at – 
Uh, Tulsa didn't get him, lost to Oregon, coached against him. When he was at Oregon, I was at Colorado. When I got the job at Tennessee, um, almost missed the call, boarding a flight from uh, from from Boulder to Knoxville. His mom called me, you know, said he was leaving Oregon. He wanted to come to UT, uh, recruit him at Tennessee. Um, you know, he had a really good season um, our second year there. You know, fell off last year a little bit, but really excited to have him here for his last year to kind of help him get back in his what, career the right what, way. What are you hoping to get out of him this year? Because he's coming down – like SEC Pac-12, right? Now you got him in the Atlantic 10. You got him replacing a guy that kind of made a similar move, right? In, in Deshaun Schwartz. What do you what what is he going to give this team this year? A jolt. You know, that's that's how you would describe him. He has that tick, he has that SEC speed, strength, physicality. Like mm-hmm. he just gives that jolt um every day. And um he can score the ball, he can guard. I mean, he's a really competitive um winner. I mean, he's been at three NCAA tournaments, Sweet 16s, one, two, two right. conference championships. Point guard play to me. I think when it comes down to what your team is this season, you got guys that can make threes. You got a pro in the middle that can make a difference, right? Point guard spot is the question for me. How do you see that coming along? You mentioned Devin Dinkins earlier. Yeah. Ronald Polite is back, yeah. right? So yeah. how do you how do you see that spot playing out and how important is it for you to get it's been competitive players? in practice? You know, Ronald, um, you know, he'll start Saturday in our first uh, secret scrimmage. Um, he's been great in moments. Uh, Devin Dinkins has been great in moments. Saquon Singleton has been great in moments. Saquon has really been uh, coming on here of late. They'll all play the position. Um, you know, Ronald's getting the first crack at, at the starting spot in our scrimmage on Saturday. And um it's still a competition, you mm-hmm. know, it's still a competition and it's, uh, it's good. It's good to have. We didn't have that, uh, last season, you know, and I think that was, that was to our detriment, you know, the lack of depth in competing for minutes, the lack of depth and ability to have iron sharp and iron in, in, in training camp right. and practices. Um, and lastly, obviously in games, I had to let some bad stuff slide because it was from my best players. I don't want to do that. Like this year, VJ, Josh, Coop, Ticket, anyone, you know, if they're falling below our standard, um, especially defensively, yeah. they're coming you know out. if you mess up, you're getting you're – getting, You're yeah. coming out. The bench is the best teacher. You're coming out. Mm-hmm. Couldn't do that last. Had to let a lot of stuff slide. Um, so I'm really excited to coach with that type of depth. All right. There's one thing that has to happen for your team this year for you guys to be able to win the A-10. What mm-hmm. is that one thing? Wow. I mean – you got a guard. You got yeah, a, I mean, that's so tough. Over. I mean, I, I couldn't even answer that to be a question. I mean, St. Louis, Dayton are really good. I mean, it's going to be a battle, I think, this year. Who knows what Loyola is going to be the, for the I mean, the league time. is going to be it's really, a, really good at the I top. think it's a really, 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 good, really, good, really good league. Um, I think it's a really good and league. I think the tough part about it is you look at some of the teams at the bottom of the league, too. Like Fordham is getting better, right? Yo, UMass Fordham. brought in Frank Martin. Yeah. Rhode Island brought yeah. in Archie. Like, there's yeah. – there's yeah. I mean, good Fran teams Dumphy is at, you know, LaSalle. Like, I'll, yeah. Fran will forget more than I'll ever know about, you know, basketball. He's brilliant. Um, seen it so much. So, yeah, no, it's I, – I can't answer that question. I don't know. Maybe um, – no, I can't answer that question. You know, it's a lot. It's not, it's not one thing. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not one thing. You know, in, in, in this league, you have to, you know, you have to, to take care of the ball and make shots. You know, you, you, you have to defend and rebound, you know, and, and the, the contrasting in styles in this league. You have to play a lot of different ways because the teams make you, you know, you can be preparing to play against the Princeton, against Richmond. Yeah, you and make then, that Richmond trip, you're going to go against Richmond, DCU they play the one next way. Day. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, you know, Mark Schmidt with an incredible coach, sustained success. You know, ton of really, really, really good sets that his guys know. N- completely new group of guys, you know, that that these guys have to learn, you know. Mm-hmm. So really excited about the league. Yeah, it'll be a fun league. It's going to be a fun one to watch. I'm excited to uh, to be around it this year. I have two more questions for you, yeah. right? Big picture. We're going to introduce the world to Kimmy English. What is the uh, – you, you've overcome a lot, right? What is the biggest adversity, the biggest step that you've overcome in your life to get where you are? Um, is it getting rid of the Baltimore accent? No, man. Uh, it's, uh, you know, well, yeah, no, I, I have a speech impediment. I stutter. I stutter right now. I have a stutter. Um, I've 
gain control of it. I remember, man, when I first, when I was playing, it was one thing, you know, you can, you're, it's not much, I shouldn't say there's not much thinking and playing, but there's a lot of reacting. It's your, it's reactions. It's, it's pictures that you've seen a million times that you're just negotiating and navigating through. When I got into coaching and knowing that I'm someone that has a stutter, I mean, I was like, sleepless nights i never forget uh at Tulsa my first year I did uh the personnel I did the personnel for every game Dennis Felton who's with me now he presented to the team and he did all defense but he had to go recruiting and I was the only one that knew UConn's personnel mm -hmm. and he like springs it on his late night in a text hey I won't be there tomorrow Kim you got this was going to be my first time presenting to the team in a film room like this and I'm sitting in the back and I'm like, I'm going to stutter so bad. And I'm like, man, I, and I do. And we're doing, and I'm stuttering. The guys are laughing. It's my first time ever. Like, if you don't stutter, like, you know, if I let some of our GAs run a drill or something, you got that frog in your voice your first time talking to a group. Yeah. It's, it's like a nervousness. Yeah, it's a, a nervousness nervous. yeah. if you don't stutter. So I had that first time coach nervousness plus a stutter. So it was just like, <laughs> like it was the worst thing ever after film everyone's laughing frank hafe saved me frank hafe like we got we were at like uh i can't think of this you come maybe brian boatwright and he like stopped me and he he does the rest of the just reading off of my notes um but you get a little bit better and then getting on the court for the first time you get a little bit better and for me my stuttering it's it's it has a lot to do with confidence you know, how confident I am in what I'm saying. You know, I don't speak unless I have conviction about the topic, right. unless I have some sort of knowledge. I don't, I won't say anything if I don't know. So it, it forced me to study the game more, learn the game more, dive into things more, because when I did that, I felt like what I was saying was important. And I'm trying to help you with what I'm trying to say. Like I'm trying to give you something as a player, um, so that kind of gave me the confidence well, I'll, of settling. I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I knew that you had a stutter mm -hmm. and I've never noticed it before in any of the conversations that we've had. And I think it's impressive that you can look back at situations like that and laugh at it now. Oh yeah. How long did it take you to get to the point where like now it's stuff yeah. like that is, is funny? Yeah. I mean, I still stutter and it happens in mobile. Our guys know that guys know Kim stutters. Like if I do get caught up on a word, they know I'm the master of, um, like a what's it what's not a dictionary what's it called where it's not a what's what's the word where it's like you get another word like antonyms the thesaurus the, the yeah. I'm, I'm the king of anti synonym synonym <laughs> or antonym it's a synonym well, yeah same thing yeah wait they're different Syn synonym, synonym is the synonyms, same yeah, yeah, yeah antonym is opposite yeah the, yeah right. the thesaurus yeah the yeah. thesaurus I'm the king of like synonyms <laughs> and I feel I control my stuff I feel when it's something about to, a stutter is coming mm -hmm. I can flip a word like that. It means the exact same thing. And I'll just avoid the stuttering word, the consonant, even if it's C's, I'll go with J's or H's or whatever. Um, so it's a lot going on in this brain. But uh, <laughs> yeah. no, yeah, no, I still stutter. It's a lot less. I have control over it. I help stutterers all over. I, I help stutterers in the media, players. Um, they're like, well, it's like an army of stutterers all over mm -hmm. the country. Um, and I check on them. You know, uh, the kid, Parker Stewart. Uh, he has a speech impediment to a kid in New Mexico right now and some coaches, people in the media that I try to help with their speech impediment. All right. So this is the last one I got for you. The one thing right now, know what you know, that you can tell your younger self. Man, uh, be humble. 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 Um, it's it's everything. Humility is everything. It's one of our core values. You know, if you see it's at the end. You guys get that illity, illity, and that's humility. Um, in all moments, in all times, you know, you know, just just just, and and it's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's constantly thinking how can I be better. Um, so just really, really, really dig in my roots in that. Because it's human nature, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's human nature to think you're really good, to think you got something figured out, you know, but you're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're not. I mean, it, it was it was it, and it's so funny. You get these pictures. So it's it's my daily. You know, it's it's the first thing on my phone to top of 
I got this list of things that I need to do, you know, for me to be my best self as a coach. It's my, what I look at on my phone at the top of it, it's, it's humility. It's like number one. Mm -hmm. And you feel it coming as a coach and your players. Like it is everything in coaching to keep guys humble, right? When success happens, we beat Maryland last year. I literally get to the locker room and I open my phone and I delete the Twitter app and I delete the Instagram app. Like app, like the first thing I did, I was like, I don't even want to see what's happening right now in this area. Like, I don't even want to see it. <laughs> get on the bus, watch the game quickly, move on to James Madison. Like, <clears throat> guys, move on, man. Like, what's next? Like, James Madison's the most important thing in the world right now. Like, we 4-0, three straight 20-point wins, go win on the Big Ten road, top 20. We lose the next five. We lose the next five games. Like, but it was a wake-up call, right? Humility. Humility, man. Does, does Humility. stuff like that help in the long term? I, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, our guys know. I have I have moments from practice games, everything still. They're like, coach, the guys are like, uh, seat, and the other day I was on the phone with Dion Lee out of Louisville, and he's he's Davon Cooper's guy. And we were talking. He said, hey, you think Coop can uh, play some at the one for you this year? I was like, man, last time he was at the one was at LaSalle. He got picked. for <laughs> Like, <laughs> those things are, and he's like, man, that's old. There they go. But those things are always there and we have a saying in our program you are one of two things in life you're humble or you're about to be <laughs> like that's it i like you know that. so yeah i like that well after this podcast and how many times i messed up i think i am about to be very humble no kim english thanks man Appreciate george mason coming. head coach Fairfax. it's been the a10 insider podcast